Hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the panel discussion on multimodal logistics power, the future of warehousing in India. Uh, we have very esteemed panelists with us, uh, right from uh, various segments, from industry, from consulting, from multi development bank, and from government. Uh, I will quickly introduce them. So we have Mr. Sabesh Sachi Mitra with us. He is the director with public management, financial sector, and trade division, South Asian De Department of Asian Development Bank. He specializes mainly in development finance, policy planning, regional cooperation, and institutional partnerships. He has co-authored two books, including a publication, Bhutan, Pathways to Growth, Oxford University Press 2016. Uh, we have from industry, Mr. Ranadhir Reddy. He is the CEO of Rail and PFT Business of DP World Subcontinent. He has worked in various senior positions of state and central government and PSUs. Held various senior positions in operation and planning in the railways, Ministry of Fertilizers, and was additional commissioner municipal corporation of Hyderabad. Uh, we have Mr. Jeffrey Thomas, who is partner logistics and transport infrastructure, PWC. He specializes in the railway and logistics sector, leads a team of professionals who focus on strategy, due diligence and operations, transformation solutions and develop growth strategies across 3PL, container logistics, oil and gas logistics and freight terminal business. Welcome to all the esteemed panelists. Uh, Mr. Prakash Gaur is joining in a couple of minutes. And we have our, our own Professor Roy, Devjit Roy, Institute Chair Professor of IIM Ahmedabad, who is the model. Yeah. The and we have our fourth esteemed panelist joined, uh, Mr. Prakash Gaur. This meeting is Yeah, he's the CEO, National Highway Logistics Management Limited, uh, NHML, which is a 100% owned SPV of NHAI under Ministry of Road and Transport and Highways. With a rich educational background in planning, economics, and transport from India and Europe, uh, with over two decades of professional experience in urban and transport projects. Worked with various institutions like SPA Delhi, SEPT Ahmedabad, international consulting organizations, and IFC and World Bank in the past. Welcome to the all esteemed panelists. Over to Professor Roy. Yeah. Thank you so much for the entire uh, panelist, esteemed panelist, and the center for organizing this uh, panel discussion. Uh, today, we are talking about a much important topic for India, especially logistics. Uh, we all have seen India's uh, logistic performance in the last several years. What is promising is that we are improving every year. If you see recent performance, our indices are we are 44, 48 in terms of ranking. And if you talk in terms of our performance, we lag a bit on maybe on the infrastructure side and on the timeliness and other metrics that we can improve significantly. What you always hear in any kind of trade discussion is that our logistic costs are immense. We talk about 14% of our GDP is our logistic cost. If you say, where are they coming from? If you talk about logistic costs, they primarily stem from different sources. One of the most important sources is transportation. So 40% of logistic costs stems from transportation. Another lion's share of 26% come from warehousing. 24% of the cost comes from inventory and other order processing administration costs on the 10%, right? So between these two, a significant cost comes from warehousing where we actually store the product and also move the products by transportation. Let's dive deep into the transportation segment. If you talk about transportation, a significant share of transportation stems from road. So 64% of the pro products are moved over the surface here, and 27% goes with the rail. Of course, in India, even today, the coastal shipping and the inland waterways are very small, like 5% and 2%. And we also use pipeline to the tune of 2% for transportations. If you look in terms of the cost structure of the transportation, what you will notice is fascinating that roads are quite expensive compared to the rail. If you talk about the Indian rupees per metric ton kilometer, the roads are about 3.6 in comparison to the rail, which is about 1.6, right? So it is expensive to move products over the road. 
But what is also equally interesting is the growth in the road sector. If you see in comparison to the years from in the last two decades, you will see increase of the road volume from 494 billion metric tons per kilometer to 2019 where it stands with 2697 billion metric tons per kilometer. So there is a staggering growth in the road in spite of the high cost. On the other hand, if you talk about the rail, even though the cost is lower, we do not yet see very significant growth yet. So if you talk about 2010, 10 years back, it was about 900. Now we are roughly about 1,200, right? So clearly, our shippers, our customers prefer still the roadways for the primary mode of transport. So if you talk about the whole cost structure and in terms of what can we do in the country to reduce the cost, we still probably use roadways because it is direct home to home or a door to door delivery, no additional movement. But if you see in terms of value addition, today we have several warehousing clusters in Vivendi, several logistic parks that add significant value to the producer. Not just that, we also have very successful model of intermodal terminals such as the Adani at Patli and DP World Facility in Hyderabad and multiple such ICDs can be named out. But if you combine these two, is that equals to multimodal logistic park or it goes much beyond? So today's topic is to understand what is this multimodal logistic park? What is the structure behind it? What kind of value addition and promise does it make to reduce the logistics cost? As you see here, they talk about a minimum area of 100 acres, connectivity with multiple modes of transport, minimizing the coordination delays, talking about specialized storage solutions such as cold storage, automated solution, handling different kinds of cargo, big bulk, bulk cargo, containers, and so and so forth. Right? So the promise is quite significant. This is one of the outcome of the ADB report from the Asian Development Bank. They nicely classify the whole MMLP in terms of different kinds of cargo, such as dry cargo, uh, containers, also in terms of perishable, non-perishable, empty containers, stuffed containers. In terms of storage type, talking about covered warehouses, open warehouses, talking about facilities and the value addition in terms of cold storages, pest control, talking about improving the shelf life of the product, providing multimodal transport by minimizing all the coordination delays. Uh, that also promise on doing some very significant value addition in terms of de-stuffing, packaging, create customized packaging. In terms of common facilities, like you expect in any ICD, you have Bay Bridge facilities, you have all utilities, you have connectivity, communication between different modes of transport. You have linkages, port, customs, railways, end users, bonded, bonded warehouses, documentation, and so on and so forth. Given this promise, I think government also realizes, and in the budget, there's a significant stress on the multimodal logistic farm. In fact, it coincides very nicely with the PM Gatishakti National Master Plan, where now we'll be able to visualize what are the potential areas in, in our topology where there is a contiguous land availability, where there can be significant coordination among different modes of transport, both roads, railways, airports, ports, mass transport, waterways, and so on and so forth. So given this promise, I think there is already a development here. And today we see about proposed 35 locations of the MMLP. Among them, you will also notice that a few of them, for example, are under construction. One is under construction in Assam. And there are multiple, one in Tamil Nadu, Maharashtra, and Karnataka which are in the bidding stage right now. So I hope it gives you an idea that the MMLP holds promise. Tremendous promise because it's not only about value addition and storage, but also about minimizing the delays in the coordination among different modes of transport and adding value and simultaneously cutting down cost. What cost we're talking about? Both in, trans in terms of warehousing cost, inventory holding cost, and the transportation cost. So with this, I will give the floor to our esteemed panelists over here and would like to hear from them now. So one thing we already know is that when there is a discussion about the MMLP, the multimodal logistic part, there is also a significant discussion about the SPV structure, the special purpose vehicle structure, 
where you have kind of equity structure from the state government, from the National Highways Authority of India, from the Indian Railways. And there's also a significant push to attract the private parties and as operators for this terminal. So what you want to first question you want to check or do you rather discuss is that what is the kind of the structure proposed for the MMLP, both from the investment side, but also about how do you ensure that the MMLP is indeed a successful model? At the end, what are the SLAs that we plan to guarantee? And what are the operators should ensure what kind of SLAs while they're implementing such an MMLP model, right? So we'll go over the uh, floor and we'll have with us, maybe we'll start with uh, Mr. Prakash Gaur. So Mr. Prakash Gaur, would you? Yeah, Mr. Avi, good afternoon to all. I'm really sorry. My apologies for joining late because of some technical case. So first of all, thank you. I am Ahmedabad to giving us this platform and opportunity to discuss this. Today, I would say buzzword of infrastructure. And you can see wherever we talk, it's talk about the logistics. And as you rightly said, before I come to the structure, I want to give you some in why this is a buzzword today. So till now, we were building the infrastructure with an objective to create infrastructure for the user people. Now the entire shift has gone from the creation of infrastructure to creating an efficiency in infrastructure. That how this infrastructure is going to create an efficiency in the systems and how this is going to become a competitive to the market. When I say competitive, meaning is not just infrastructure per se is competitive, but infrastructure become a backbone for any production system, for any economy, to make the economy competitive. That is why uh, what you mentioned in the in the in your opening remarks that our entire objective is to bring down our logistics costs from, from 14% to 9%, which is almost 50% reduction one is really looking for. So that is why this entire logistics sectors has been taken as a, a focus on the government uh, per se. Coming to your first point, what you said about the structure, you know that this entire logistic system was planned in as part of Bharat Mala Pariyojana, which is a very big program in phase one itself is almost more than five lakh crores, uh, the program where almost 34,000 kilometers of network is being, is being built in this 10,000 already under construction, 2,000 is already built. So the objective was, should we build only roads should we build economic corridors? Should we build highways? And so are other peer ministries like railways. Another thing is, or should we converge at one place and provide the efficiency? So one way of converging is a physical convergence. And when this was happening, it was you mentioned on one word coincident uh, and your thing. It was not coincident if you ask at the government level. It was a very pre-planned manner. This entire thing was done. That is why you see the outcome of entire thing. Last year was the PM Gati Shakti program. So, the, so it is how do we really bring the physical convergence of all these infrastructures, whether we are building the economic corridor or expressways or the railway is building the freight corridors or the other uh, the railway lines, railway terminals, the port and shipping ministries are building the port terminals and, 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 a, and a dry port or a, or a set of terminals at some places. And same with the states are also developing the other facilities. So the idea is that physically one all should converge and provide the efficiencies to the facilities. And this will not only happen as a physical convergence unless you have an institutional integration. So the foremost task for us is that to bring the institutional integrations, then only you will be able to bring the physical efficiencies in the system. When we talk about the multimodal, I always say multimodal is always multi stakeholders. And very important for all your viewers to, to, to understand that multi stakeholder when it comes, it is important that all the stakeholders should come on single platform. So this time when you see this SPV word, what you heard from the multimodal especially, it is not just for the sake of creating any special purpose vehicles. Here, each of the line ministries or the concerned departments coming forward joining hands together, creating a vehicle, which in turn will deliver infrastructure. So what is important is 
that we want to deliver this entire infrastructure on a ppp basis public private partnership basis on a design build operate transfer so i not go to the much detail of that depending on the time we can further take more questions on that but what is important in structure is that we create a special purpose vehicle with the railways the ministry of road transport ministry of shipping and the state ministries uh preferably the industry department of the ministries we have each in the uh, uh, state has like industrial development corporation if i have to give example like maharashtra has maharashtra industrial development corporation gujarat has gidc tamil nadu has tamil nadu industrial development uh, industrial development uh, industrial development corporation those corporation also came forward and we are forming a special purpose vehicle each of us bringing our own expertise and then offering a concession to the private sectors so till now what was happening is private sector was running the pillar to post and creating uh, that infrastructure and there was a time lag and the challenges was happening and, and and not able to bring efficiency in the system so the first thing what we did is when we create this platform the concession itself is been granted by this spv there all the stakeholders there so when you know to run around to the to the railways or to the highways or to the state government or or the or the shippings or as the case maybe even indian waterways iwa is also coming on 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 board for this thing is so as the case may be all of us will be forming spvs and in turn will be providing one thing i would like to highlight in your in numbers i see in your last slide when you mentioning the tendering stage some 600 crore or 800 crore numbers were given for each of the project which are at tender stage these are the investment envisaged by the private sector but if you ask us almost equivalent amount of investment is being made by us which is if you ask us it's like a in a longer term is sunk cost because the land the railways the highways the all the infrastructure what we provide is being done up front so if i take a investment of of any project where you mention 800 crores around similar amount or maybe more is being invested by us up front into the project that will helping the private sector to really leverage this infrastructure and delivering the quality because our objective is very simple clear with single point is that how do we really bring the logistics cost down and as you mentioned in your, in, in in your slide that one thing is that you are able to take major upfront cost by the authorities number two when you are creating the intermodal facilities the intermodal shift will be possible wherever the load and lead is longer that be 400 500 km plus then you are really looking at shift from from road to the to the rail mode or 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 the waterways as the case may be still be but it is not just the intermodal transfer station one is really creating this i am sure if you take the example of europe or or or, or japan and or the korea who this is which i am aware about this thing is when you see such facilities it is not just about the modal shift one is really looking is is also the mass customization becomes important thing is when i say mass customization i'm sure you must be teaching to, uh, in your academics this thing is that how the commodity really becomes just in time for the product where in supply chain both in forward and backward link linkages i am able to minimize my inventories the moment i am able to minimize the inventories my really cost will come down so one is my transport cost will come down second my improved quality of warehousing will cost will bring down but third is which is a very important cost for any entrepreneur or any industry is is the inventory cost uh, for that matter and if i if i am able to do a just in time this thing is i will i will i will be able to really reduce this and the fourth component which we come so when i talk about the mass customization the value addition of the product so when you are doing the value addition this thing is economies of scale and economies of scope comes into the picture this thing is will you reduce the cost so that's how we are able to deliver this thing is and we are giving a 30, 45 year concessions to the private sector this is the first time i see in the country where such a long concession are being given in this keeping in mind that you are building infrastructure for next generation not only for yourself number one number two the development period you are not just looking that you do it in next two years and then in 50 years you out no we know that this has to be developed for a large scale even greenfield uh, the industrial nodes which are being developed by a friend in uh, by a peers in the uh, dpit the uh, nigdig national industrial corridor developments along with the states there are the last greenfield nodes are being developed those can also be leveraged in next 45 50 years 
third important point in this thing is we are proposing this to develop in phases the so phase one what we are saying is you need to develop the facilities the facility has to be operationalized within two years time and the phase two has to be completed within 10 years phase three has to be completed within 15 years so we're looking at facilities to be completed over a period of time not later than 15 years it can be developed earlier maybe five years seven years three years depending on how, how market reacts to changes but there is enough question is available because our objective is it should go hand on hand with the industrial development it should basically become a backbone for industrial development because days have gone when industrial investment if you today goes to any international investors and ask you want to come i will provide you very good quality water power industrial infrastructures this is fine then they ask the states what kind of incentives will do there is a certain industrial incentives comes under the industrial policies but the third backbone infrastructure becomes now people start asking is where is the logistics infrastructure is available is how my goods will be really evacuated my, my, my final product will be evacuated from this place how my raw material will come and if i am like auto industries or, or that kind of industry how my ecosystem will really come in place if that is being provided that will really become a leverage for the for the industrial development to this thing coming to the last point which we says the kpis so we have uh, the model concession agreement which is approved by the ministry of road transport and highways in this sector and this after a lot of deliberation by various ministries this is a very long list exhaustive list has been given for the key performance indicators where we have defined for each of the components that how we really need to perform in this thing this so though on one side we are giving a lot of flexibility to the private sectors even the must plan what we are giving is we are we are checking them on the basis of investments the private sector can come and improvise the must plan bring the value engineering but is to ensure that 30% of the investment is we made in first two years time so the facility is being operational what is as long as one is compliant to the definition of mmb what you mentioned in, in your slide is thing is but on the operation side is important that if you really want to have a logistics cost to come down it's a game of efficiencies so we have defined a very long list of kpis i can go on and on and on on those individual parameters that what should be my turnaround time what should be my delivery time what should be my gate clearance time this thing is all that has been defined and and and, and the cargo type also because this time it is not looking at and like a containerized cargo we are also looking at the bulk we are also looking at the liquid cargoes and and and, and break bulk and other facilities thing is at some places we are also looking silos for for the for the for the agro commodities which are being developed so there are very defined list of the kpis which are being given that is available in public domain in the your viewers and your people can can study that and then really come back on separately on this basis i think that summarizes the point of your uh, question you asked i think it does uh, mr god thank you so much also talking about the structure but also linking it to some of the kpis which is very important while we are at the investment discussion maybe it's the right time to also talk to mr sabesh mitra to understand his perspective of investments in this particular mmlps and why is adb interested how it's aligned with that mission thank you so much professor roy and uh, let me begin by you know congratulating the center for transportation and logistics of ahmedabad for hosting a, a panel discussion on a topic which is extremely important um, uh, for the country uh, if you look at uh, and i'm also very glad to be among colleagues here i mean some of us have been working together for a long period of time uh, prakash is here you know we have worked together for a long period of time uh, we are in fact intensely engaged with him even at, as we speak uh, jeffrey has worked with us uh, for i think last 10 more than 10 years and uh, you know um, together and of course we have mr reddy from the you know dp world who provides a very strategic private sector you know insight into the functioning and the evolution of this sector let me first begin by stating that look in the i would say seven last seven eight years there has been a kind of a tectonic shift in the overall policy you know, landscape for the logistics sector and this is not just i'm talking about the evolution what prakash laid a very good foundation for this discussion is not just the you know you talked about the bharat mala if you trace it along with the economic corridors the development of the national industrial corridor development corporation if you look at the sagar mala if you look at this creation of a logistics division 
in the Ministry of Commerce and Industry itself, you know, is, is a landmark in 2017. And then all of this culminates in the PM Gati Shakti uh, plan, you know, the national master plan that we have. So, so the foundation of that, if you see, you know, is extremely important to understand where we are coming from. As Prakash was talking about, it was very discrete structures we were, we, we were having earlier. Now you have all these convergence, not only of the physical uh, infrastructure, but also of the software uh, you know, infrastructure. And within this context, I think you talked about the development of MMLPs. And in that, I suppose the, you know, the regulatory and institutional framework is the most important one. You know, you, it, that, that's something which I would like to focus on as the first part of it when you talked about, because, you know, that's because as Prakash talked about, it's, it's a huge coordination task. And we all know in literature, what, what are the risks of coordination failures you know, and the cost of coordination failures that happen. So that's where I think having a you know, regulatory and institutional framework is extremely important uh, for a successful MMLP in terms of the you know, implementation of the MMLP. And it takes time, it, it, it can't be done overnight. And if you look at the report that we had produced, there are two important, in fact, we looked at the two important options that have been talked about there. One is, of course, which Prakash talked about is a PPP model, you know, which is the development and operation of a MMLP, you know, on a, on a, by a third party provider, a third party player, where the nodal agency, be it the state or the federal government, um, provides the land and collects the lease rentals. That's one option that you have. The second, you know, is the nodal agency itself as the master developer, you know, and in such a case, what happens? the nodal agency develops and operates the common infrastructure and the you know the amenities within within that and allows the individual third party uh, players to develop and operate the operate the facilities within the MMLP you know the revenue in this case is collected in the form of again lease rentals or revenue sharing now we have looked at these two you know and within that we have looked at four entities that can be again structured in terms of the SPVs out here I will, not, I will not go through all the details, but you know, we can look at the first entity, which would be responsible for acquiring the land and leasing it out, out to an SPV. Um, in a second, the entity can be, can be the anchor in investors itself, you know, who, who develop the common facilities, core infrastructure, and, you know, and such as power water. And depending upon the risk, risk appetite and the operational advantage, the other players can come in. The third set is the entities which can be responsible for developing the external infrastructure, linking the MMLPs to the, you know, the production centers, the distribution centers, the trade getaways and others. And the fourth set of entities could develop and operate the individual facilities within the MMLPs, such as the ICTs, the warehouses, the truck terminals, the private freight terminals and others. So various kinds of models that can be talked about. Now, Professor, Professor Roy, you talked about uh, quite, you know, rightly some of the touch the main issues. I'll just briefly touch upon some of the issues so forward looking, and then you can talk about a bit on the warehousing part of it, because after all, we'd have as the topic, the future of warehousing in India. Um, so the three or four points here, one is when we are looking at um, uh, forward as a roadmap for logistics, I think the government, as I said, is, is a huge tectonic shift in the landscape that has happened over the past, I think five to seven years. And this whole PM Gati Shakti plan is a milestone in that, brings together the, you know, the, the, the physical infrastructure, the, the regulatory institutional technology, it also brings in the whole skill development, the human capital into it. Uh, but a couple of things I would just point to point out here, which 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 which, is, which are very important when we look at logistics, is the impact of climate change. And here you you talked about the transportation and road tra road road transport, you know, and the decarbonization of transport sector will be extremely important if we are to you know, fulfill some of the commitments that we have made. And logistics will play again an important, important role here. We have also seen the role of urban logistics, the whole e-commerce e e part of it that has been come up so fast uh, out, out there in the, especially I would say in the last five or six years. A third important point of logistics when we discuss, don't forget the role of logistics, apart from the issue of the supply chain that Prakash talked about, you know, and its importance in the product in raising productivity and competitiveness and ultimately improving the share of manufacturing in the GDP. 
is also the other part is of disaster risk management. Uh, that's an extremely important point the logistics sector will play uh, and, the, and the mobilization, you know, in, in, during the time of any, any, any natural event, you know, the role that the logistics sector will play in that. Often, you know, those three elements, we, we're talking about a large amount of freight and industry here, but the urban and the disaster risk management are the components that we should, we should be all coming together and looking at it. The other important part you talked about in your slide is warehousing. I think you know that was a very you know important thing talked about. Of course, we know the basic function of warehouses, you know, and issues. But I, I, I think you know if you look at warehouses in India, it has been largely the challenges we had in front of us is largely unorganized, public sector oriented. But it is it, it is in fact transforming if you look at the policies that are coming through and other points, uh, you know. But Two, two, two points just I would like to like talk about the warehousing because you know in your slides you in the pie chart you talked about you showed how warehousing is an important component of the logistics in India. One is that the warehousing can be used at the at, at the beginning of the supply chain, in the middle of the supply chain, and also at towards the last mile of it. And this is where it's important because if you look at the beginning of the supply chain, warehousing becomes an aggregation platform. So yeah, where where we are looking at the aggregation part of it. Now in the middle of the supply chain, if you look at it, it's typically where the intermodal shifts are taking place, you know, and warehousing is playing a very important part, you know, where all this intermodal, uh, you know, facilitating the intermodal shift. And the third part is the last mile that you're talking about is about the distribution and linking of these, you know, the distribution, the consumption point, the trading points and others after the segregation and the aggregation that you're talking about. So the role of warehousing is extremely important in a country like India, where we are trying to, you know, strengthen national supply chains and link with the global value chains, you know, for increasing the productivity and competitiveness of the of the of, of our manufacturing sector. I mean, as an economist, I would say that three important roles also the uh, warehousing plays. I think very important we look at it and we remember this in mind when we are doing our policy framework. One is price stabilization. You know, extremely important when we look at that. Second is also there, they are also, you know, a very important role they're playing, which we often, you know, are underplaying is risk sharing. The risk sharing that they're playing with the with the with with the manufacturers, with the distributors and others, and that's a very important point. You know, they are a part of the insurance mechanism that is taking place within within, within this sector. And third, of course, you know that very well. Where you're coming from, Professor Roy, is the financing role of warehousing. You know, because uh, the kind of things that they can do in terms of the intermediation in the whole financing of uh, the logistics sector, they can do. And these, I think, are very important. The last point I would talk to, I would think, I would talk about warehousing. Housing here is that when we look at warehousing, also I think time has come also to look at you know when we look at warehousing and the points that um, uh, Prakash was also talking about is at the time of certain kind of standardization warehousing, uh, you know because that will help manufacturers you know uh, to 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 ensure a certain quality uh, in in terms of their productivity or, or in in the in the product in in the in, in the supply chains actually, and in terms of both in terms of the basic infrastructure and also in this terms of process automation as well as the value addition services that are there in these warehouses, some kind of standardization that have if if that happens I think that will go a long way in in, in improving this whole you know value addition within the logistics supply chain that we that we're talking about. So let me stop here and leave you with those thoughts, and then we can come back a bit more later. Thanks very much. Sure, sure. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mitra. I think some of the points that you bring about the value addition and how we can use warehousing to cut the logistic cost with better automation and also other value things like price stabilization all were worth noteful. Uh, at this point, I think it might be good to also hear the one who practices the day in, day out, Mr. Uh, Ranadhar Reddy, I think, Mr. Reddy, you have immense expertise in uh, running large kind of ICDs, including the uh, Dubai DP World uh, ICDs at different places. So what is your take on this whole MMLP? And what do you think is the difference between the traditional ICD that you operate versus the MMLP that is being proposed at this scale? And what will take you all to reach that particular level? Thank you very much. Uh, that was well. Uh, the discussion has been very well laid out with the context setting out really 
crisply and then the various insights into MLP projects that I was also not aware for some, you know, there were very um, good um, insights into this topic before I came in here. Thank you very much for that. So I would, uh, having uh, discussed on the concept and the operationalization and the structure of the MLP, MLP that would come in, that would be set out uh, let me come from the other side, from the, essentially this, these are PPP projects. So let me see from the private developer uh, standpoint as to you know, how these pan out and then what, uh, if there are any challenges for, for the private uh, developer or what exactly is required or what is generally required for uh, this. Because I also had, inter I've been fortunate to have some interactions with uh, a consultant on an MLP project at Surat, where you know we, we were looking if our facility could be converted into us. So there are some uh, 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 insights which uh, um, have been uh, uh, given from that end also. So primarily from the uh, private developers' uh, perspective, one is of course the land aggregation has been already talked about since the nodal agencies or the nodal investors or the lead investors are going to take care of pretty much of this. But uh, uh, one issue which comes in here is since this is going to be a very large capex project, uh, uh, the GST plays a very important role, the input rate for the GST, which is, which is roughly around 18% on the civil engineering projects, the civil projects. Uh, they are now, uh, you know, that becomes a very debilitating factor by increasing the project cost by almost about 18%, 18 to 20%. This was not there in the, uh, the pre-GST regime, whether in, uh, right now these input credits for, uh, uh, the GST uh, um, on the capex is not allowed. So that pushes up the project by 20%. So you just can imagine on a large capex project, uh, what uh, about 18 to 20% in the enhancement in the, in the cost would do. So probably, you know, this could be a point to ponder over as we uh, get in more into this, uh, into the bid stage or so. And secondly, there are, when we are talking about an MMLP, you know, there are a lot of support structures that need to keep it. And primarily, as we are talking from the climate change point or, uh, or even uh, the efficiency point of view, the railways is a very significant contributor to these MMLPs. And then uh, the railway rakes and all, which are procured at a significant cost, which uh, almost cost as much as the terminal cost, they are not included in the infrastructure services. You know, probably you know that they could, it could uh, there could be a thought on this uh, for so so that uh, the developers, the private developers, would be able to procure these railway rates and containers and essential infrastructure that is uh, that will enable or that will catalyze, act as catalyst to the uh, uh, project. Are, uh, is also given an infrastructure st status whereby some soft loans or long-term loans can be accessed. So this is point number two. And uh, since now this is going to be a very complex facility, we run facilities which are akin to MMLPs right now. Uh, you know, most of us, uh, we operate about seven uh, facilities in the country, uh, of which uh, six are uh, full-blown uh, uh, terminals, inland terminals, as we call them. We don't call them uh, PFTs anymore. So they are replete with a rail siding, with a ICD, with a bonded warehouse, non-bonded warehouse, and some bulk handling facilities, and also uh, facilitate very active intermodal transportation. For example, you know, between rail and rail, uh, road, and at one of our facilities, we also have a jetty, which will trigger some water. So having, um, so we are, in a way, operating uh, something called, you know, except that in the value additions and all are not done a large on a large scale at our facilities, but we do, we still do, we have some facilitation centers, fulfillment centers for steel. So we, we handle, in our facilities handle 
right from containers exim containers domestic containers to bulk to coal to gypsum to steel you know we 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 handle steel from all the stuff, leading manufacturers so in a way we have a concept which is already running with uh, unlike other icds of uh, ctos and all which are primarily exim centric or domestic container centric so we do bulk debulk break bulk and everything uh, at our facility so we have an indication of the issues that uh, we face with uh, today so probably you know the there could be some very small you know that probably we could take it up in another session and maybe it is not appropriate to really come up with a wish list of but again just to give a flavor of uh, this it takes a hell lot of time for us to you know set up an icd to get the customs clear and so things have become easy but it's not so and then secondly when we are talking about this mmlp there is a customs policy saying that within 100 km radius of an existing icd this will uh, a new icd will not be given again it goes through a very extra um, um, uh, elongated process of uh, approval and all you know probably i think Uh, if these things like the rail uh, railway permissions and the uh, customs permissions of uh, and if they are all intertwined with the development of the project itself right up front that you know deemed permissions or deemed approvals are given for that then probably it becomes easier for a private developer to come in because again time is of essence for him because the capital is flowing in and then he can't the, the private developer can't wait for more approvals coming up to make his uh, facility because even though 45 years looks long enough and all and then we are having a phased growth but still every day because most of the money is spent up front in, in the first few years it's not and then later on the investment uh, bucket start coming down but again that is the nature of this business i guess you know we can't do any do it any other way that you know, most of the investment has to come up front and then and once the investment comes in you know there would definitely you know be a pressure on the developer to start answering the investors or start looking at the profitability or even servicing debt servicing you know just to give you a perspective so many in the cto regime almost of or eight or nine cto uh, container train operator license you know when they were given in 2007 people jumped in and then you have a huge um the um, uh, rate of failures there are almost five to six companies have already closed down so that's how uh, this um, uh, risk is this business is going in as much as it is an enabler of an economy and as much as it is required it in the time of the day but again you know we need to take these safeguards so that the investor interest you know i'm only talking about i'm not trying to put in a wish list or this is not an um, uh, um, uh, not an exercise to sound out alarm bells but again i'm only saying that you know this is these are simple things that can be taken into consideration for boosting up the investor confidence so that the private investors really come just to say that you know even when 2017 we had this policy 2022 we are still with four where we needed to do 35 and all so that itself uh, you know probably you know the um, may talk uh, uh, something about the you know confidence that is required to be given to the investor and uh, not just certify from a from a, a, a more uh, at a higher elevation if you were to see there was a study uh, 20 years back 25 years back you know where we were talking about railway was trying to rationalize their terminals so they wanted a hub and spoke terminals of 250 uh, over the country to ser- service on a pan india network you know these are all you know all these mmlps are more akin to those hub and spokes and today the requirement could be more so just 35 also going forward may not really help or solve our problem because given the extent of uh, the geographic extent of the company country then uh, probably you know we may soon have to go up with mini mmlps or whatever it is you know so that we create those 250 to 70 hub uh, uh, logistics centers you know which would actively integrate you know that comes to the question of mr mitra that you know how do we really forge a optimal mix model mix and how do you bring out so that the real uh, share starts going up but ever since independence you know rail share is only going down and the road is going up you know in as much as we threaten few 
that that is not a very efficient um, mode of traffic but again you know people you know it seems to be proving itself against the rail largely because of the you know the network synergies and all which we were to build and which are not really getting uh, built i think which are taking time to which they were taking time to so i think you know you know this is a great great opportunity for us to really uh, uh, forge this you know the um, uh, shift in the way you know, and then these these would be the, the, the mmlps would be harbingers of uh, change for uh, uh, a healthier model mix and all i would say and there's so much of importance that we attach to these uh, projects but it's just that you know how we go about doing it so i think i would take a you know a break here and then before uh, if there are any uh, questions or so then probably i can take it we can save them uh, thank you i think uh, mr ready bring about very important uh, part of the private de developer and what are really need looking for from the whole ecosystem i think that is very important especially in this context where we are looking for a lot of participation uh, from the private uh, operators as well So at this point, I think we'll go to our expert in the house on logistic and transport infrastructure, Mr. Jaffrey Thomas. Uh, Mr. Jaffrey, I think you heard about the whole discussion so far, and since you have been consulting with the railways and logistics sector for quite some time, what is your take on the MMLP, and do you think that MMLP will indeed provide enough kind of facilities to cut down the logistic cost, and if so, how we can really make that a re ground reality? So, what is your take on the whole uh, logistic paths, more than multimodal logistic paths? Right. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Roy, and 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 thank you for putting together a great panel here as well. Uh, I, I must really congratulate you for that. Uh, uh, I, I'm sure this is a very insightful discussion for all of us, even on the panel today. And uh, thank you to I'm Ahmedabad for that. Uh, with regard to specifically your question um, as to what, do i see the promise of mmlps coming true and and i think absolutely yes there, there's absolutely no doubt about it uh, it is it is high time it is very opportune time uh, as well that that we as a country have mmlps developing and and it is it is not just the need of the hour right it is also something for which viability now starts making sense as well as we as an economy have also transformed over the last decade or so mmlps as a concept will also start making more viable sense which is where i think uh, mr gore also draws his confidence in terms of saying that the idea is to look at developing these on a ppp model is now where we as a country in terms of the economy are and and i'll go into a little more detail on that subsequently right it it, it does make sense for us to develop mmlps with private sector participation uh, because that fair element of risk sharing between the government and the private sector is now possible and to a large extent commercial viability at least in multiple pockets do exist for private sector players to have a play uh, and and get their return on capital however uh, going a little further into what you asked and and i think uh, the way i look at mmlps uh, and and i'd go uh, very similar to what mr mitra was talking about that that the real heart of the mmlp being successful is is warehousing taking off is is warehousing becoming a success the intermodality is one part of it and at least the way as i see it it is more incidental uh, to 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 the overall scheme of things but what's really important is is the warehousing taking off and and even if you look at your uh, 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 one of the slides that you were showing earlier uh, apart from the whole share of transport etc you'd also shown inventory holding to be about 24% contributor to the overall logistics cost now that 24% inventory essentially means that there's a very high degree of unreliability in the system because this degree of unreliability is high people are stocking more inventory right uh, had we been a country where we only dealt with traded commodities uh, such a high inventory could also make sense because you would have stock and sale as the primary mode of business but that's not the case today in india we 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 do all range of products from from pharmaceuticals to uh, to to engineering goods right 
So really what this indicates is a very high degree of unreliability in the system. And which is where at least I hope that the MMLPs will, will form a basis for a higher degree of reliability in the system because of various services being anchored from the MMLP. The second point that I want to bring about is why I say that warehousing is a game changer and is essentially something that will contribute significantly to the viability of these MMLPs is that we as a country have also grown beyond the what we used to traditionally call value added services. For example, we would treat customs clearance, bonded services, packaging, repackaging. We would classify these as value added services a few years back. But if you talk to the industry today, the nature of logistic services that they require from MML and MMLP is not just custom services, bundling, unbundling, and things like that. The industry is started asking for a lot more beyond that. Uh, people are asking for only channel services to be provided from MMLP, MMLPs, etc. So the more complex the value-added services that you can provide from MMM and MMLP, the higher is the chargeability and the potential to make returns. Hence, even from a market acceptability perspective, right, the kind of services that the industry is now asking for, you can charge amounts which make such projects viable. That's the other important change, which is why I say that the timing is opportune. The third part that I'd like to touch upon with regard to the warehousing bit is again something that uh, I think Mr. Mitra, someone had touched upon a little earlier, is the focus on sustainability. Really, these multimodal logistic parks could become the anchor for, for increased sustainability in the entire transport chain. And, and for example, uh, uh, I think Germany or France, one of those two countries, has a very clear model that their logistic parks so if you have last mile vehicles, which, which are moving out from those MMLPs or what they call logistics facilities or logistic parks, then there is a certain degree of emission protocol that those vehicles will follow. But at the same time, they have discounted toll available for vehicles which touch those MMLPs or which are providing first mile or last mile services from those MMLPs. So that is both a sustainability initiative built in plus also a cost imperative for the transporters. And it makes the overall value proposition of the MMLP stronger. So I think sustainability needs to be built into these MMLPs with a very clear focus as to how we can use sustainability as a lever to improve the value proposition for everyone involved in the trade there. So I think from a warehousing perspective, these are some of the important things which touch upon, uh, which, which are required to be looked at and which would determine how, how successful we become. Uh, and, and it is important, I'd like to reiterate, for the uh, whole warehousing play to be successful and, and standardization of warehouses, et cetera, are all, uh, I think, spoken about multiple times. I won't go into them again. But I think those are really important to make the entire MMLP play successful. On the other part, and, and which, which I say is incidental to, to, to a MMLP, is the modal shift, where we say that the MMLP would enable a modal shift from road to rail. And, and I think uh, while the whole PM Gati Shakti uh, initiative does bring in a lot of confidence that railway infrastructure will get integrated, I think the real success will depend on how the commercial policies of railways adapts to targeting lightweight cargo. That is essentially what will determine whether the modal shift happens or not. So, and, and Mr. Reddy here uh, uh, can, can talk a lot more about this. Uh, uh, the, the kind of challenges that the entire container train sector has been facing uh, with regard to dealing with lightweight cargo, uh, unless the whole commercial mindset of the Indian Railways changes, just developing the infrastructure will not enable modal shift. You might be able to achieve another 3-4% incremental, but really the bulk of the lightweight cargo, uh, uh, small unit cargo, all of that, unless the commercial mindset and commercial policies don't change to that effect, modal shift will be difficult to attain. But, but that still does not impact the viability of MMLPs because as I said, the whole intermodal part according to me is incidental. Uh, 
whichever mode is competitive will drive it, but the real value is coming from the other set of activities that will happen at the end of that. Happy to go into more detail uh, later. As yeah. Yeah. So I think, Mr. Thomas, you, you, you hint upon some of very crucial part because what you expanded is also what you mean by value-added service and how complex the nature is today, right? I think you're talking about going beyond traditional just packaging or repackaging or stuffing or de-stuffing and moving far to the omni-channel-based services and more complex value-added services. And uh, also, how do you leverage sustainability and bake that into value proposition? I think those are some very important points that you raise into. I think with that, uh, let's just move to the another set of questions that we also wanted to have the discussion on. Is today, if you see the interest from the private operators are not very much there yet, right? So as a whole SPV, what are the initiatives we are taking to garner more interest from the private operators? That is that one question. And do you see any kind of challenges you foresee in the future as you go ahead in this particular path? So maybe I'll start with again, Mr. Pankaj Gaur, and we'll, we'll take it from there. Yeah. So thank you, Professor. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, I would like to first, before I go to your point, I really appreciate the point made by by, by Mr. Jeffrey in his uh, defining the value addition of product. Because what is going to happen in the Indian market now, when it's going to become more comp competitive, the industries, I'm sure this you will be knowing more than anybody else, that the industry is going to be focused on more core competencies. So when you focus on core competencies, you outsource your other businesses. Yes. The better person who can. Movement this starts happening, which is happening 20 years before when I was in Europe. I see this very much happening. And I'm showing the same thing going to shift here also. Then the demand of the customer is going to be very important. And then the, what Mr. Jeffrey said is going to be very important that it's not going to become mere intermodal shift uh, terminals or, 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 or an inventory place or this thing is. It's, it's going to become a completely house for, for industries to provide what the core industry cannot provide this thing is. It's because I want to focus on my core competencies and outsource my other business. And, and that's why you need to really think slightly a longer horizon of, of 40, 50 years and see what's going to happen. Is, and there the scale is going to become very important. Because it has to be cost competitiveness, because it all comes from the cost competitiveness, nothing else. The market has to be, com if you want to be competitive, then this component will come. And then, this, as I mentioned, economies of scale and economies of scope will become a very, very important buzzword in, in, in this. The coming to this point on especially developing as infrastructure per se, what is important here is that, see, in the past, not much, you have seen the examples you have seen. Thing is, though there are a few players, but it has been the industry is still in a, at a, at a nurturing stage, if you ask me. So there are players, there are many players in the industries, but many are of the of the warehousing per se only limited. There are very limited players you see who are into the real form of MLPs, as you have seen, given your example itself, few examples are being quoted by in partial definitions, yes. The MMLPs are there because it evolved in the last 20, 25 years. But but the way we are looking is, uh, the way our panel itself is looking is, you can see a commonality of definition is coming in this, is, is really looking that industry has to be nurtured. For this. And that's our, one of the objective. Our objective is also to make it our, our entire structure, documentation, more industry friendly. In this. If you see that kind of documentation we have done, especially model consumer agreements, another thing is has been more industry friendly oriented, which I personally have not seen in, in, in past many of the infrastructure sectors where this has been done, be it from the lender's perspective, be it for the developer's perspective, or be it the investor's perspective. In this. And, and I distinguish the three when, when, when I in this. And of course, regulator has a, has a limited role, uh, which, what it should be thing is. Providing the basic infrastructures, giving all the approvals, and doing the monitoring of the facilities, what is what is being delivered. Having said that, yes, we are uh, using various platforms. We are interacting with the with the markets, and we are trying to understand in thing 
for the qualification purposes also in this documentation we are trying to bring more players so so the investors community can also participate and bring their uh, technical partners at appropriate time to to deliver this infrastructure so so on one side the documentation another thing is been placed that thing is the intense dialogue with the industries are being done we have done ourselves over at two large conferences by 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 the, by the ministry itself in in last december and then in subsequent one more and then next month we are further doing one more conference by the ministry uh, where we will be holding this again uh, a session on, on on logistics per se parallelly our other ministries ppi is there also ho hold that uh, this interactions uh, and we are also encouraging institutions like you and other places where this reach out to the people happen because as you have seen that uh, mr reddy himself mentioned being in the industry he, he say that okay lot more things are there and this are very 10 minutes uh, timing you know i can only talk very limited very high level points to the industries so when we have a long sessions long interactions it is our all job also nurture and interact with industries to interact and i am seeing that in times to come that a lot more player will come so we just don't do 35 we do more as he mentioned in that that india being such diverse and large countries we may require and i agree with him it is not just a very large scale mmlps but we also need to really think at the at the at the complete hierarchy and network of the, of the, of the infrastructure is being built in this so we really do a work of have a spoke system where large hubs have been done where the real large production centers or uh, or large centers are there and then you have a smaller centers what they call is fulfill center or, or different terminologies are there so in 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 the very large cities and mega cities you may have multiple uh, uh, such hub facilities on 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 the outskirts of cities in east west or north south directions and within the cities you only have a distribution centers of a smaller scale so the sustainability factor which which uh, mr sabi spoke and 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 jaffi spoke on this that's that's wonderful mr gor i think you you talk about some very interesting points about documentation and how can limited documentation or more friendly documentation can help in in getting more parties interested in it so any other thoughts from uh, mr mitra and mr reddy and mr jaffrey on the similar lines in terms of how can we get more parties involved to participate in these mmlps and any kind of challenges do you foresee in the future let's go to mr mitra maybe yeah please thanks professor roy um, i think uh, prakash has touched uh, most of the issues out there I mean, specifically, I think as as Jeffrey was also talking about, you know, the core issue of warehousing. You know, if we bring it to that, and so it it also applies to, uh, you know, the, the more general context of MMLPs. I think some of the and uh, Mr. Reddy can, you know, maybe you know, um, uh, discuss this more in details. When you, when you discuss with the private sector players, I mean, what are the issues that they talk about? They talk about the facilitation. in say land uh, that's that's a major 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 issues that they talk about in simplification of the allotment process for example i suppose that's one of the issues that that comes across consistently in discussion uh, with private stakeholders when you talk about uh, we we are and if you look at it you know uh, the whole the whole landscape of industrial parks have been mapped now by dpiit you know there is a whole GIS platform where every industrial park of the in the, uh, the country has been mapped uh, out there. You know it's called industrial park um, uh, information system or rating system, um, and within that system, you know I think you know, you will see also where are the warehouses within that zone uh, within these industrial parks and zones. That's an excellent example of doing that. You know and 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 out there. so every industrial park has to have that kind of a allocation and space for those warehousing I and mean, within warehouses was there jeffrey was was talking about what kind of value addition are we talking about in terms of product specific geography specific you know and you know we are not seeing very large you know what's extremely important is scaling up 
you know, of the of, of these warehouses that we're talking about. You know, so what we're talking about the multi-level storage facilities, you know, facilitating the zoning and the floor space index relaxation within these areas, you know, in, in, in these warehouses, those, those becomes important. Um, and of course, you know, we can also look at uh, some of the, you know, redeveloping some of the spaces that we already have, you know, uh, to ease some of these constraints that are, that, that, that are facing us. So those are some of these, I think, actions that, you know, might, you know, if we can look at it, you know, both at the federal and at the state level where we are developing these things, I think that I think are some of the factors that we can lead to a more, you know, in terms of uh, facilitation of the private investment in these MMLPs and in these warehouses. So that's some of the things that we can look at. We can discuss a bit more in details in each of these things, but I'll let me leave at the key issues that, that I discussed and hear more from Mr. Reddy and Jeffrey, maybe. Please, Mr. Reddy, if you want to take it up. Yeah. Uh, I think pretty much has been said on this. You know, I would only suggest that uh, there could be one simple way uh, when it comes to creation on the approval, you know, when the project is laid out for bidding, for example, um, uh, so from the NHAI side, the road connectivity would, it implies that it is already there. From the rail side, yes, now all the plans and approvals and all should be, you should have a pre-approval for that. And for all the structures that will go in there, because, you know, you have at least 100 statutory authorities and the powers and permissions that are required to take. We take it right from the local urban development authority or the municipal corporation, for example, on the warehouse side. You know, there could be so many issues because there are still some facilities with the CTOs or in the current players where certain structures are not yet approved. Even they've been uh, after uh, you know uh, being operated uh, on for about a certain thing you know not very serious, uh, but again you know it doesn't really give a good feeling to the investor, isn't it? So once this project, for example, it should be taken as a separate zone in itself, and all the facilities that need to go in into the MMLP should be pre-approved, provided this they uh, uh, they uh, conform to the stip standard stipulation, you know, your building norms or whatever it is. But again, there should be no requirement for a fresh permission or whatever, and whatever has to be, you know, a so that will reduce, because otherwise, after bidding for the project, the, the private investor would only be running again, you know, uh, um, uh, in uh, circles to about 100 odd statutory authorities with his applications and their approvals. And for example, on the on uh, customs also, it's a very long process, you know. For, and when we decide that an ICD has to be there, so now when when the when the project is bid, um, um, then it could be, it should be a deemed approval for an ICD and no special, uh, as long as you conform to the stipulations of that acre area, say ten acres or whatever, and the customs building of a part or of a particular standard or whatever it is, and the paving of a particular standard. So that right from day one, the private uh, investor would only be looking at, there should be one wing, a single window facilitation center, who will do, and then the developer is only developing the project without losing any time. And by the time he finishes the project within this one year or two years, then he should be good to go with all these, you know, at least the approvals and so that could be that could really go this is a very revolutionary um, idea which i'm suggesting which is not easily implementable with the various governmental agencies and all but yes if uh, the lead agency the nodal agency for development of these mmlps if we treat it as a separate uh, geographic entity which they are uh, and which they are bounded on all sides and you know there are all sorts of uh, um, uh, a boundaries drug. So I think that could go a very long way. And then look, sooner or later, you know, all these things will come in, but after um, a huge amount of sweat, and then, uh, for example, there's so many ICDs where the, the facilities are ready, they are not uh, getting, even today. It's not a problem with a deal. Fortunately, we are over that stage, but again, when we go into the next stage, then probably we will again come up. 
but there's so many facilities which on one reason or the other you know they would uh, uh, start incurring some time delays and then these time delays can be excruciatingly uh, uh, debilitating for them because money has flown out of and then again the capital has already been deployed and uh, these things are going to hurt the investor very badly and also the investor confidence also will start at some point uh, start to there so this could this is one and second um, very important uh, uh, distinction is you know when we are doing all this when we are talking about a rail versus road and the optimal model makes and all the railway should not as jeffrey has also pointed out on the lightweight cargo the railway even today while on policy it you know the ctos are partners in progress but uh, in reality ctos are taken as competition you know that, that's something you know that's a paradox which is uh, there which needs to and even the railway needs to come out because finally the railway freight is coming to railways isn't it whatever is running on the rail it is going so in addition um, and it's just that you know what investments are going in on terminals of railways is you know railways is not investing on the rolling stock they are not investing so that's so much so capex less for railways but the freight is same you know freight is already uh, uh, coming so in railway should not you know should just dealing hook off um, uh, any charges on these uh, facilities because these are facilitating higher amount of cargo onto the rail isn't it they're pushing more uh, um uh, cargo on to the rail so unless that mindset is developed or probably you know you know uh, some clarity is um, uh, brought in and then in terms of restrictions and all because ctos should be not should not be viewed as competition to the railway cars because finally you know they are pushing material on to the rails and for which freight is being paid which is again going into the pocket of railway isn't it? so that uh, mind uh, you know probably you know railways may not really agree to this my version but again um, but i feel you know that's how you know that, that that's where a lot of change uh, can come out so i think uh, i'll stop with these two points you know <laughs> i wouldn't like to run the laundry <laughs> laundry list right now probably well say very insightful thank you mr reddy can i also give mr thomas before Yeah. So, so I have quite a few things actually <laughs> that in in mind that I thought uh, I I could suggest. Uh, firstly, I, I I do completely appreciate what Mr. Gore was saying that that uh, this is the first of its kind of development that is being undertaken. So it is new. Hence, getting the appetite of investors and developers in uh, could be a little challenging to start with. Uh, because because it is entirely new in that sense uh, but but at least uh, the the basics which are required for any uh, investment uh, of this kind to work that which is a pipeline of projects to be shown so that no investors know that this is just not one two or three projects but an entire list of 30 projects large scale investment all of that at least in those terms the pipeline has already been shown uh model documents are available so so all the basics to that extent have all been done and taken care of in terms of some very specific things i think which can really uh, possibly make investors uh, bite more easily into this uh one and and i'm i'm here assuming that everything that mr reddy mentioned with regard to the infrastructure related permissions and sanctions been available that i'm assuming that nhl ml would already have in place before the project comes for a bit so so i'm not going into that part uh, i'm i'm just assuming that uh, that's a very relevant point and that will be taken care of even before something comes to a bit apart from that i think a couple of strategies which could be looked at is one does it make sense to decouple the intermodal terminal and the rest of the logistics area depending on certain locations that kind of a strategy can also be pursued wherein the intermodal terminal is is done more on a service model rather than a concession model or a development model right and and, and the rest is brought in as as a, on a ppp basis uh, the intermodal is purely a service provided by one terminal operator to all ctos all train operators all aftos on a undifferentiated basis 
So then you're creating a network of terminals for everyone to access across the country. And, and, and I think that would also, because see the nature of risk of an intermodal terminal and the nature of risk of a logistics or a warehousing play is very different. Hence the appreciation might be there in different category of investors. So decoupling those two in certain locations might make sense. Second, I think what should also be made available when any of these bids are coming to the market is a very strong feasibility assessment done by NHLML or the concessioning authority itself. That and, and, and the soundness of that feasibility assessment gives everyone a lot of confidence as to how much merit is there in the value proposition that is being spoken about. So I think that, 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 that's the second key thing which could help address some investor concerns and developer concerns. The third area, which I said uh, earlier as well, I touched upon is that sustainability related incentives need to be tied into the MMLPs. For example, we all know that on the long haul, heavy haul trucks, EVs might be some distance away, but on the lightweight first mile, last mile kind of transport vehicles that we require, EVs are not far away. And, and such kind of EV infrastructure, along with incentives for charging when tied to MMLPs, make the overall MMLP value proposition much better. Right. So uh, th th there's a whole uh, list of things that could be done. But I think on a, on a very top level, on a very uh, 50,000 feet level, these are the kind of things which would drastically change perception, especially in something which is so new to the market and, and you don't have... Uh, 40 organized players running in this market already. So, so in that terms, uh, I think this should go a long way. Sorry, Mr. Roy, you saying something? Way. Yeah. Yeah. I was saying we'll just take up some Q and A from the uh, audience now, and also Avi, if you have questions, please. Yeah. So, India has a very you know, big segment of informal logistics player. You no. Know? Take from freight forwarders to you know, small warehouse owners, uh, you know, to small time CFS owners and all of that. And with MMLPs coming up, this would become formal. And big you know, boys, big players would come into the system. So uh, uh, you know, this question is to Mr. Prakash. Goswami. How do you see you know, to support each of these? You know, what is the thought process in terms of how do you see that change which would happen? I uh, know because of big players controlling and the whole system becoming more formal, more structured and uh, all of that. And is there a possibility of any monopolistic attitude? You know, if something is given to you know, one player in terms of pricing and all of that. Sir, yeah. Yeah, yeah, Savi. So very good, very interesting question for me also. As I mentioned to you earlier, that when we develop this MLP, it is not just develop MLPs in isolation. So we have to develop the hierarchy of infrastructure, in, including in the space of logistics. So it is not just the large scale facilities are being are being developed here. It is also the small scale facilities. In fact, we have already come up what we call is warehousing zone policy as the ministry. And under this warehousing jewelry policy, we are having a small scale format for the medium and small player in this, which is for the market to play. But for us, more important is, as I mentioned, to have a spoke system really works in this. But what is important also need to see when you structure the industry and when you organize the industries, it is always in the benefit for the end user and the industry both in this. So at the end of the day, when you're creating a complete ecosystem, organizing Western industries and nurturing it and creating a very specific format for the industries, it will not only help the industries, it will in turn will also help the end users in this. And our entire objective is to ensure that the end user, which is the, not the common uh, persons, he is going to get a very competitive cost product uh, in the market. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> so I have a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, one second. So uh, there's a question by Mr. Varun. 
what steps are being taken for promoting innovative research in transportation and logistics and how can more and more startups avail those and also add value to the community uh, so uh, <clears throat> mr mitra can you you would like to take this or uh, mr jeffrey anyone here yeah so so maybe i'll come in on that so so uh, <clears throat> i think we as india uh, have a very strong logistics or a logistics tech ecosystem that is building in now uh, if you look at fy21 and fy22 uh, i think fy21 the three biggest sectors of tech investments or startups startup investments in this country were retail tech health tech and logitech logistics tech was was number 3 there uh, i if i'm right fy22 uh logistics tech was bigger than health tech uh in terms of total investments coming in to startups so there's already a very ripe startup ecosystem which is there with a host of investors uh across venture capitalists these a b c uh nature of investors who are active in the space the government separately through the whole startup india mode also is supporting various startups across the sector uh a lot of logistics tech investments also get routed through agri tech uh, investment support programs that the government runs so that's also another mechanism which is available for logistics tech companies so if you look at it uh, both from the public sector side as well as more so the private sector side now you have a lot of investment uh, 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 environment and ecosystem getting built which can support a lot of startups thank you there's a question on uh, by mr pranjal what is the importance of digitization in the mlp and logistics space and how it can streamline the entire setup so any thoughts on digitization uh, use of advanced technologies in the whole multimodal logistics park So, Abhi, if I can quickly come in here, uh, just one before I need to leave in a few minutes. So, a couple of things. I mean, I think what Jeffrey uh, spoke about, you know, uh, the whole, you know, uh, the digitization of the process is increasing at a very rapid pace. If you look at the logistics industry, and uh, you know, if I look at just warehouse, there are two parts to it, you know, and the whole value-added services within the within the logistics industry. I mean, there are two kinds of things. One is basically the extent of automation to support the core, you know, processes that is looking at, and the you know the extent of automation to support the, what shall I say, the processes through you know the end-to-end -end kind of uh, the management and solutions that have been provided. And in both these areas, if you look at it, there's a huge amount of you know startups and other you know companies that are coming in to support this. And it can be from everything in terms of material handling. If you can, if you look at, in terms of automated machines, in terms of deployment of you know either robots or drones, the whole range you're looking at, including very important you know talks about palletization and things like that. And in terms of the support services, if you look at automation of support services, and that's where the whole adoption of, you know, as you have seen in some of the more advanced economies of smart warehouses, of the, you know, AI and the execution systems, you know, to keep the kind of, you know, order fulfillment optimization solutions and others, those are also coming in out here, actually. So, you know, there's a whole range and and things are moving at an extremely fast pace. So the opportunities are there. And I think, I mean, I'm sure I means ready or Prakash from both the user and from the supply and the demand side, you know, will attest to the fact that, uh, you know, there is, an, there is a complete, you know, sea change that is taking place. And that's where a lot of these, you know, um, what you call cost optimization will come in actually, and efficiency improvement will come in, which in turn will you know, actually improve the productivity and competitiveness of the Indian manufacturing actually and exports. That's, that's where the focus is all about in terms of the structural transformation taking place. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks, Mr. Mitra. Yeah, so uh, we have almost covered no. Uh, so there are many questions, but uh, we have covered most of them during our discussion. Yeah.
so professor Rai. Yeah. i would say i think uh, there are a couple of takeaways for us here one even though it is an evolving concept i think uh, the stones are set in terms of how uh, the processes are kind of laid out to facilitate more participation from the private operators i think they're still evolving and what we also learned from today's session was all about the component of warehousing how crucial it is going to be and we also learned about value addition beyond the normal i think that was also quite fascinating we learned about integrating sustainability into the ground level metrics for making uh, this model much more feasible and viable and what is also interesting is how this can the model can be used to leverage to reduce the logistic cost if you have to put in one line that would be more about is going to probably improve the reliability of services hopefully reduce the inventory reduce the delays and hopefully the overall logistic cost is going to come down so with this i would like to thank all of our esteemed panelists and also the ctl center for organizing this uh, wonderful session i'm sure the participants learned quite about mmlp but also about the prospects of mlp in the future in india so thank you again uh, all the four panelists and we look forward to have many more such interactions in the future thank you so much thank you thank you professor thank you everyone thank you. thanks thanks everyone, everyone. thanks, thanks. thanks.